my recovery, just my recovery. Okay, recovery. That I'm, I'm like, when I go home, that I'm not depressed and that I maintain in my sobriety. All right. And how long have you been sober now for? I'm going on three months and two weeks. Oh, wow. Praise the Lord for that. Thank you. Okay. I've been in a program. I just want to be able to stand on my own two feet when I go home. So I'm going to make sure I keep up the schedule I have here at home. So. And I also pray um, for my friend Duran for his recovery as well. Okay, very good. And uh, let's see here. Sister Leslie's on? Hello. Okay, and Brother Toss is on? Yep. Lord. Oh, by the way, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9 for a little bit. We're not seeing you skipping around, so you're going to have to be, your fingers are going to have to be limber. So you're going to have to be doing some stretching exercises, because we're going to kind of all over here. So, <laughs> so we're going to be covering, uh, we're going to actually go and study a little bit about Paul. We kind of got on that a little bit, and so, uh, all right, and Mother Rosie, I see that you're on. Okay. All right. And so, okay, so I got the prayer request here. Uh, we'll give everybody just a kind of a minute or so. Am I, did anyone else have any prayer requests? Robert does. Okay, hey, Robert. Um, lost me. Uh, my sweetheart just lost her wallet, or somebody just walked off of it. appointment tomorrow at UCSD and it's for the Lord's wisdom and guidance in my treatment and for my daughter Emily's healing and her salvation. Okay. Oh, I have a okay. Well, I've actually been like praying for this country for a day, like the United States, like Jesus has been revealing so much to me, but I just pray for the best for America and the best for, but, but you know, put up a candidate, president. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, let's do this thing if uh, we can all turn our phones on mute. I'm gonna honor the Lord now. Oh, hold on, let me just turn this part of AC here. Okay, so we're still getting a little bit of feedback. So everybody put their phones on mute, and then, uh, because after this prayer, we're going to go into worship. All right. Uh, Father, Lord, we thank you for gathering us here, Lord. This is your Bible study. This is not our Bible study, but it was you established it, Lord. You even established it even before you laid the foundation of the earth, and we just thank you for this, Lord. Father, your word says, but two or three are gathered to know that you are here, Lord. And so we all come before you, Lord. We ask for forgiveness over our sins. Wash us in the Lamb's blood. Wash us with your word tonight, Lord, and just fill us to overflowing with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Because your joy is our strength, Lord. Father, uh, we lift up uh, Joe to you, Lucy's husband, Lord, and we pray for uh, these... Uh, Issues in his legs, but we pray that you would give him healing and strength so he can walk correctly. Lord, we pray for his sister, uh, Deborah's nephew, Michael, that you would uh, uh, be with him, Lord God, and uh, heal him and strengthen him. Lord, we ask for direction for sister uh, Tracy, Lord, that you would lead her, Lord, that she would not lean on her own understanding, but lean upon you only. Father, we pray for uh, Brother David and his wife, Sama. Uh, and for their marriage, and Lord, we pray especially for Sama that she would come to know you for the Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our God, our Creator, and your Son. Lord, we pray for her sister, Shay, for her recovery, Lord, in the schedule she's been on, and we thank you for the three months of sobriety. 
Thank you. Father, we pray for Brother uh, Robert and his friend Catherine who lost her wallet. We pray that you would, Lord, please bring it back, Lord God, and keep it yes. in front, and that there be no misgivings there, Lord. Father, we lift up Sister Leslie, Lord, for uh, guidance in her treatment. Uh, we pray that your healing touch would be on her, and also on Emily, her daughter, and her salvation as well. And Lord, we pray for a brother Tots. Uh, well, we, we lift up the U.S., Lord God, to you. We ask that you, know, you would be merciful, for you are merciful. We know so many things you are allowing, Lord God, to show us that how far we've drifted away from you as a nation, Lord God. We look back to the show, even from the 50s, and it was a godly nation, and we see what's happened, because we have taken you out of our schools, and even, sadly, Lord, out of the churches, Lord, that we don't preach you anymore, Lord. We're just so broken over these things. We just ask for your mercy, Lord. We know that you can work all things for good. And we just ask that you do this, Lord God. And that you will turn men's hearts and women's hearts and children's hearts back to you, O God. Father, have mercy upon us. We ask these things. We ask for a blessing upon the worship. May we please him in your sight. That we would truly worship you in spirit and truth. Lord, and, uh, and, uh, and also that uh, you would feed us from your word, Lord God, tonight. That it would be you who be teaching by your Holy Spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Amen. Uh, before we do, okay, before we get to the worship, real quick here, Sister Leslie, are you there? Okay, so uh, I got that. You saw the call that came in, and I felt like the Lord wanted you to pray for those two uh, girls, the young girls. Melinda and Maggie, and apparently they're being abused. And uh, this lady called, she thought she was calling CPS. I don't know how she got thought that. But anyways, uh, she, I asked her, are you a Christian? And she said she was. And she told me why she was trying to get a hold of them. Because these, these two young girls, 11 and 12, have these bruises all over their body. And so I was ready to down to pray, but I felt like the Lord wanted you to pray for them. And so can you pray for them right now? We'll all agree with you in prayer. Sure. Um, Melinda and... Maggie. Maggie. Father God, we just come before you now, humbly before your throne of grace, with thanksgiving, always with thanksgiving, for you are so worthy. Father, I lift up these two precious girls to you, Maggie and Melinda. I pray you wrap your arms of love around them and protection. Lord God, I pray that you would guide Maria, who called in to the right people to help these two precious daughters of yours, these girls. Lord, I pray that you would lead them to safety. I pray, um, I guess they're being abused by their father, Lord. I pray that you would reach him through yourself, Lord. Father God, have mercy on his soul and draw him to Jesus unto salvation. And I do pray these two precious girls would come to know you too um, in your timing in your perfect way. And I lift these things up in your precious and holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Okay. And so, Brother Don, you want to go ahead and lead us in worship here? <laughs> yes. Um, before I lead us in worship, I'd like to say something about the prayer that you said earlier about the church uh, not speaking the word in the day and age we're living in. Um, there's a church up the street that I have gone to and uh, I once told the pastor, I said, uh, I said, you know what's wrong with the churches these days is that they're not preaching fire and brimstone. In other words, they're not preaching the fear of the Lord, that, that there's consequences for sin. And so, one why, thing, can't we, why can't we pray for the lady that was having a problem over the weekend? Uh, okay, hold on, Sister Priscilla. Uh, we'll, we'll pray. Go ahead, Donnie, you want to finish your thought there? Yes. Uh, so anyway, I told the pastor that the churches are not teaching fire and brimstone anymore. And that, and that they need to see that. And so one Sunday I showed up and he did a sermon on, on fire and brimstone. So he, he actually listened to me. He actually uh, listened to my criticism about the church. This day. Yeah. It was kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, praise the Lord. And the big thing is they, they just got to keep, if they just stay in the Word, and just read like the whole books, and say, you know, uh, 
you can read it exponentially from, you know, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, you'll come across all those different things. And so, Priscilla, you said that you wanted us to pray for uh, someone. That, uh, what lady did you say now? The lady that was having the problem this weekend. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay. So can, she's can, you, yeah. can you throw me a prayer too for uh, the, the Lord who used me in the AAA meetings when I go to him? Okay, we'll, we'll pray for you. Let me, let me pray. She's talking about uh, Sister Lisa was going through a bad time, and so uh, she was texting the group, and so she, she has some issues there. So we'll, we'll pray for her as well. Thank you for bringing that up, Priscilla. All right, uh, Father, we do lift up Sister Lisa to you, Lord. We just ask that you would be with her, that you would help her, Lord God, to uh, whatever it is, Lord, if she uh, falls back into the, uh, these addictions, Lord, we just pray that you would remove those things, Lord God, and set her free again, Lord God. Father, uh, we ask that you send your angels around to protect her, Lord God, and we plead the blood of Christ Jesus over any addictions and over any spirits, Lord God. Uh, we just pray that you would move those out, Lord. Father, we also pray for our brother John, that you would use him at these AA meetings. Lord, uh, be with him, Lord God. Fill him with your spirit and choose him, Lord God, for your glory. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, you want to uh, go ahead and lead us in worship now? Yeah, I'm going to lead us in a song called uh, Watch My Face. Will I believe you when you say, Girl, I will guide my every way. Will I receive the word to say? In every moment. Okay. Yeah, that's right. I was at mute. Okay. 
Okay, Patricia, so you're going to read after Todd. Okay, we're going to be in Act 9. Okay, and then David. Okay, and then we'll do, how about Sister Leslie? And then how about Sister Tracy after Leslie? And Sister Deborah? Okay, and how about uh, Brother Juan? Are you able to read one? I'm a little sleepy today. I'm a little, little tired, so I will. Okay. Okay. Well, that'll keep you up. Okay, I'll, I'll try. All right. Okay, Juan. And then how about Adam? Are you able to read today, Adam? Are you there? Yeah, I'm trying to take one for you. I'm able to read. Okay, Adam. And then how about John? Uh, I'll be able to read. Yeah. Okay. And, uh... Are you able to read, Jake? I don't have my bus with me. Uh, I can't get home. Okay, Brother Donnie. Okay, Brother Donnie. Yep, I didn't get you here. Okay, so, all right, let's all go ahead and keep our phones on mute so we don't get any feedback here. But this is the order. It'll be Michelle. Uh, Patricia, David, Leslie, Tracy, Deborah, Juan, Adam, John, Jacob, and then Donnie, and then we go back to Michelle. Okay, so we're going to be in Acts 9, uh, but before we go to Acts 9, uh, I'm going to do a recap, but before the recap, I just wanted to share, and again, we've been doing this, it's kind of a discernment uh, area, because the Bible says for us to watch and pray, as we know we're approaching the final few years, right? And so this morning, I don't know if you saw this afternoon, but the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, had a press conference. And so he was talking about, you know, the, the, the pandemic, but also about the fires. And he said this, he said, you know, I don't have any patience for people who deny climate change. He said, all you got to do is look up and, and see. So I hear in Modesto, there was like so much wind all of a sudden came in and it got the smoke, it blew in just like dust. And so the skies was like very orange. It looked kind of eerie, right? And so what he referred to is this, in just the last few months, we had this land hurricane, which they call the derecho, right? Which means the Spanish Strait. Then they had two regular hurricanes that crisscrossed in Texas, in the exact same place. Then they had the no rain thunderstorms that hit the Bay Area, but the lightning caused the fire. Then they have all these fires here in California. And then, I don't know if you knew this, but yesterday, it was 97 degrees in Colorado, and tomorrow it's going to be 27 degrees. Think about that. They're going to go from 97 degrees to 27. And then here in California, if it wasn't bad enough, now they're shutting off the power because of the wind that's coming in. And so they're afraid it's going to knock down the power line, so they're, they're having what they call a power, a public safety uh, power shutoff. And so all of those different things. And so what he said is this, is that he's, He's putting it on climate change. Well, it sounds reasonable except for one thing. About six years ago, the Lord spoke to my friend Manuel and said that he was going to begin to change the weather patterns. So this is not a result of climate change. This is God himself changing the weather patterns. Why he's changing them? I don't know. I have a feeling that it's his way beginning to warn the world that they, that they need to get right with him. But there's something else, too, and this is what the Lord made, did make clear. Because the judgment in the book of Revelations and that the way that the Lord Jesus described them, people will begin to put two and two together and know that we're approaching the last day. And they'll begin to repent. So what did Satan do? He came up with a lie called climate change. So rather than repenting, people think that they just got to stop using fossil fuels. Because he knows the Bible's true. And so he knew these things were going to happen. So what he did is he came up with this one. And instead of people repenting, they're trying to drive electric vehicles and all these different things, which is nothing wrong with those things, right? But that's not going to save their soul. And so I just wanted to point these things out. So when and I use it to, to witness to, when I drive with Uber and I ask them, oh, we have this, we have this, we have this. I asked them, what do you think is causing all that? And they're like, well, you know, scientists say, and I just say, BS, it's in the Bible, read it for yourself. God's doing these things. So wake us up. It's almost like a child when you grab him by the shoulder and you're shaking him up, hey, wake up. 
That's what he's doing. I just wanted to bring that up. Okay. We saw in Chapter 4, Foshaw uh, told us that uh, stewards must be found faithful. So if you want to be a good steward and a servant of the Lord, you must be found faithful. Right? And he also went on to say, when you're faithful, your praise will come from God. Oops, let's make sure we're on mute, guys. We're getting some feedback here. We saw Paul tell the Corinthians not to be prideful in terms of their gifts or their abilities, right? Because they received everything from God, whether a natural ability or a natural gift. You got that when you were born. And later, so sorry, we're getting the feedback from your phone. Okay, Don, if you can put your phone on mute, it's coming from your phone. Okay, we're also, when we're born again, we get spiritual gifts. And those spiritual gifts come from God. So there's no reason to be prideful because God's the one that gives them. can take them away at any time. We saw Paul make the remark that the Corinthians should imitate him in the pursuit of serving God. And it's in the Bible, so we know that's true. First Corinthians 15 says this, verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. Why was his grace toward him not in vain? Because it says, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which is with, with me. And so again, if you have the will, you have the desire to serve God with all your heart, or if fully put it down like Paul did, and we're going to study Paul, God will give you the grace for that. But it's a grace. You're not going to be able to do it in your own strength. We saw Paul in 12 verses. We went back just to kind of look to see, because remember we asked, I asked, how many people want to be like Paul? And everybody on the call, I think, just about everybody on the call said, I want to be like Paul. So we went to go back to see what was Paul like. And we saw in just 12 verses, he preached the gospel, he healed someone who was crippled. After he healed the person who was crippled, these pagans, they thought that they were gods and began to worship them. And he told them, we're just men, we're not God, it was Jesus who healed them. At the same time, while they're telling them that the Jews show up, and they stole him. They dragged him outside the city and left him for dead. By the grace of God, he recovered. And he simply went into the next city to preach the gospel. That all happened in only 12 verses. That's amazing. Only for the grace of God can you do that. And we're going to see one of the reasons was because he was a blasphemer. He was persecuting the church. And so God said that. He was on his hell. Everyone else was walking there. He was running. But God stepped in and grabbed him. We saw Paul use his apostolic authority and turn over a believer who was involved in a sexual uh, relationship with his father's wife. He turned him over to things and he said this, that the he may be destroyed, but that the soul may be saved. And so again, the Lord uses these things at times to discipline us, and at times to give us a permanent time out in heaven. Because if you've been told, and told, and convicted by the Holy Spirit, and you continue in your sin, eventually God will judge it with you. To the point where he'll, he'll just take you up. And now you're back in heaven. And you have no more opportunity to serve him, to tell people about Jesus, uh, or to earn rewards. We saw that the practicing these six sins in particular will get you kicked out of the church, according to the word of God, and yet the way God uses this to root out the hypocrisy in the church is sexual immorality, covetousness, idolatry, being a reviler, being a drunkard, or being an extortioner. Those six things. Why? Because those are them their their outward sins if you can see them. And again, the Lord doesn't want those things inside the church. On Saturday, uh, oh, I wanted to share this with you. This was kind of special. So on Saturday, I was meditating on Friday's Bible study. And I was just thinking about it, right? And how that almost all of you, everyone on the call, wanted to be like Paul. And that even after we saw that Paul was seen and left for dead, remember we read that, most of you still said you wanted to be like Paul. And so I was thinking about that, and guess what? All of a sudden, it was like the Lord's Spirit just showed up. And I felt His love. But it was His love for all of you who said you still wanted to be like that. Even though Paul was stoned and, and beat down, you guys still said, I still want to be like that. 
want to be like that. And the touch guard's hard, and that's what he was showing me. And so we're going to look at this. Before we go to Act 9, let's just look over real quick. Let's go to Malachi 3. Okay, so uh, just leave Act 9 here. Go to Malachi 3. Malachi, if you're not too familiar with the Bible, it's the last book in the Old Testament. It's right before the book of Matthew. Okay? So there's a special blessing to get there first. All right, so here we go. Malachi chapter 3. Let me say amen when you guys get there, okay? Amen. Okay, so Brother Paz is there. Anybody else there? Malachi chapter 3. Amen. Amen. Okay, Brother Donnie is there. Sister Tracy is there. One more person. Let's get it. One more person there. Malachi chapter 3. Amen. Okay, I don't have my Bible with me. Okay, well, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take you off the reading list here. Okay, okay. So here it is. Malachi chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. I'm just going to read this, okay? So we can see that it's scripture. It says this. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened, and he heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Now, now he's being quoted. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. On the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. See, God listens to a conversation. Not only does he listen to a conversation, he has them recorded. I don't know how he does. He has an angel right there recording them and says, hey, write this down. Write this down and answer in my law. But he's listening. And he listened on Friday night. Remember how we say? The Lord's putting on his headset and he's on there with us. And so he was on and he was listening because I'm telling you, Saturday morning, I felt his love and it was for all those people that said they wanted to be like Paul. Even after we went through it. And you guys said we still want to be like Paul. It touched his heart and he was making that clear. So now we're going to go do a little brief study on Paul. Now if you remember... Paul was struck down by the Lord in chapter 9 on his way to Damascus. Why was he going to Damascus? Because he felt as a Jew that they were preaching this false Messiah called Jesus. He was crucified. He was dead. Why did he keep talking about it? And so now he has letters to go to Damascus and to get all those believers and bring them back to Jerusalem. Okay, so let's go to uh, Acts 9 and we're going to see this conversion here. All right, so Sister Michelle, you're going to be re re reading verses 1 and 2. What did you say, John? Okay. In the meantime, in the meantime, Saul kept up his violent threat of murder against the followers of the Lord. He went to the high priest and asked Damascus so that if he should find there any followers of the way the Lord, he would be able to arrest them, both men and women, and bring back to Jerusalem. Okay, so here we go. Paul is, yeah, he's like a Navy SEAL. This guy was armed and he was ready to go. And so the other guys were saying bad things about the, they called it the Necrochianity, and they called it the way. And so they might have been cursing them and saying these different things about them. But Paul was taking action. And he got papers, like one. And he's kicking in doors. And he's taking believers. But now he's out of them in Jerusalem. So he goes, I'm going to go to Damascus. And I'm going to get letters from the king, with letters of introduction. And I'm going to arrest these guys. And I'm going to drive them back to Jerusalem. That's how on fire he was to persecute the Christians. Because he thought that it was a perversion of Judaism. Okay, verses 3 and 4, that's for the time. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Okay, you know what's so interesting about that verse? He didn't say, Saul, oh, Saul, oh, why are you persecuting my people or my church? He said, why are you persecuting me? Amen. Why? Right? Because the church has been hidden in Christ Jesus. Amen. So we're his body. That's why he said that. 
why are you persecuting me? Believe me, when somebody touches someone, one of the believers, one of us on this call, is like touching Christ himself, because we're his body. Verses 5 and 6, that's Sister Patricia in Sacramento. Sister Patricia, you might be on mute. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and it shall be told you what you must do. And the man who traveled with him stood speechless. Hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Shall I go on? Okay. Yeah, go ahead and read verse 8. And Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. Okay. So I think the part we missed was verse 5. It says, And he said, Who are you, Lord? This is Saul speaking. The Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. Right? And then so the rest of what we just read. Okay. Verses 9 and 10. That would be Sister Leslie. And he was three days without sight and neither ate or drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. Amen. Oh. Okay, so these are believers. Right, it's like that. These are believers in Damascus, okay? So in a vision. Now, if you've never seen a vision, it's like a three dimensional, like almost like a holograph. And like literally, wherever you're at, you, it's just like the, uh, in front of my, my uh, office computer here. It's just like that. You're looking, and it's just like that. But in between, all of a sudden, a 3D hologram comes around, and it's like a visual dream. And but you're awake, and you can see it. And so every symbol means something, because God is speaking. In fact, when He shows it to you, a lot of the times He tells you, He gives you at the thought what it is. And so He's seeing this vision, and in the vision, He's I guess He sees the Lord. And he says, "That am I." He's calling to Him, and He says, "Here I am, Lord." By the way. Uh, if you remember, uh, a few months ago, we had Sister Sharif, and so she talked about how the Lord started a, a little school in her house, and then later he blew it up into this big thing. Now they have three campuses, and he did that like in three years, right? But she had told me one day, because I asked her, how did he tell you that you were going to do this school? And she said, I saw him in a vision. He, he showed me her. He showed me his face, and he spoke to her. And I was like, wow. Isn't that amazing? To see our God is real. He lives. And he can talk to you however he wants to. And a lot of the times, it's by the Holy Spirit. He can just speak to your heart. Other times, he can speak to you in dreams. He used to speak to me a lot in dreams. Only one time I saw a vision. But can you imagine seeing and you see the face of the living Christ in a vision? And he's talking right at you and he's looking right at you. God, serving God is not boring. It is exciting. Especially when you're believing in the gifts of the Spirit, which we do, right? Because it's right there in the Bible. Okay, verses 11 and call that Sister Creighton. I get it. Okay. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for the one called So a Taurus, for beholding, behold, he is praying. And in the and in a vision he had said in man name Anamia coming in mm -hmm. in and putting his hand on him so that they might receive his sight. Okay, so look at this. He's giving him a vision and he's telling Ananias to go pray for Saul. To go over there. At the same time he's telling him Saul is receiving a vision about you. And you're gonna go and he's already seen you. Yeah, the Lord does see he's a multitasker. I'm telling you, when I witness the people, or when I drive for Uber, and I tell them, this is how amazing God is. There's like 8 billion people on the planet right now. 
he can hold a conversation with all 8 billion people, all at the same time, all in their language, and know everything about them. He can sit there and, for example, for Sister Leslie, he can sit there and ask her, uh, uh, honey, I, I got your cancer, don't you worry about that. And he can be talking to Brother Todd about his classes at L.A. State. And he can be talking to Brother Donnie about his the song he's going to be working on next. And he can be talking to Juan Oru about his next project that he's going to be sending himself. And he could talk to his sister Shay and say, I got you when you go home. And he could talk to you not only in English or in Spanish or whatever language you speak, but it's all, he also can talk, he's talking the same, almost the same phrases that you use. He knows how we talk. It's just so amazing that he could do those things all, and he's coordinating the whole show. And that's just the people on Earth. There's still a minimum of 100, we did the math, and 110 million angels in heaven. And he's talking to them too. Plus, a billion galaxies and a billion stars in every galaxy. And he's got them things spinning perfectly like a little watch. He's got everything under control at all times. I think that's the one they talked about when the Pop John went to, the, to heaven and they said, I heard voices. I really believe that's what it means because he's speaking to people all at the same time. He is a multitasker of all multitaskers. Okay, verses 13 and 14, that would be Sister Deborah. Uh, Sister Deborah, you might be on mute. There you go. Uh, uh, Lord, I have heard many from about this month. How much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. Then here he has authority from the chief priests to bind. Hands on him, he said, 
Brother So, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so let's picture this. He didn't believe in Jesus. He's persecuting these crazy Christians. These people that hold themselves away. I'm going to go and arrest them. Only one problem. Jesus shows up. And with a blinding light, he just knocks them off his the ground and says, Why are you persecuting me? So now he blinds them for three days. Now he knows that Jesus is truly the Messiah. That he's really the Son of God, the creator of all things. And so now he's sending in Ananias to go over there. And Ananias is kind of arguing with them and says, Yeah, but this guy, you know who this guy is? Look at this, verse 16. He says, not only that he's a chosen instrument, but look at this. Tell me if you hear this in the church. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my namesake. When's the last time you were told that? How many people want to go and serve Jesus? And then everyone raises up their head because they're in church. And then they say, but the Lord is going to show you how much you must suffer for his name. And all of a sudden, all of them have start going down. What do you mean suffer? Joel Osteen tells me that I'm going to get blessed. I'm going to get a new job. I'm going to Hawaii. I'm going to get a new house and a new car. I didn't sign up for suffering. I signed up for blessing. I know it's not mocked. This is true Christianity. And when you sign up to serve the Lord, you're sorry enough to serve Him however He wants you. And if He wants you to suffer for His great name, which is the greatest proof that you love Him, it's easy to love God when you have everything you need. But when he starts testing you, taking things away, that's when the rubber hits the rook. I'm telling you, I shared this before, when I first came to know the Lord. I'm here, guys. Okay, thank you, sister. Everything I told turned to gold. I mean, I was like, I can't believe there's no more. There should be like millions and millions and millions, billions of Christians. Are you kidding me? I strained out everything in my life. Everything is peachy clean. I mean, it was like the best. But eventually, seven years later, he said, okay, I showed you that side. Now, I'm going to test your faith, and I'm going to start taking some things away. And sometimes he'll take away more things and more things, and now you start struggling. And you're like, but Lord, but Lord, and you have to take your prayer. But Lord, but then we have to get to the place of Paul was. We're going to see things happen to Paul, and what does he do? He ends up worshiping. That's where God wants us. And so if you're struggling and God's putting you in the fire, it's because he wants you to learn to worship him, whether he's blessing you or whether he's simply providing for your needs. Because we're not seeking his hand, we're seeking his heart. That's what King David was seeking, remember? The Lord Jesus spoke to him in Psalm 27 and said, Seek my face. And David said, My heart said to you, Your face I will seek. Okay, first... Uh, let's see here. 17 and 18, I think that's, uh, Brother John. Eighteen. Yep. And I went his way and entered into the house. He said, he said Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as though Camus hath sent me, whom I have received thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as if And he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Yeah. Okay, so he came in, just like the vision, he prayed for him, he said, receive your sight, look at this, verse 9, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ooh, that's a prayer. Yeah. That's what we should all be praying for ourselves. The Bible says that if we ask, ask the Father, right, how much more he will fill us with his Spirit. Okay, verses 19 and 20, that's uh, Jacob. Okay, he might be on mute here. So let's go to Brother Dottie. Can you read verse 19 and 20? Yeah. And he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. And 
immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. Amen. Okay, so here we go. He received the old food, he was strengthened, right? Then Paul spent some days in the disciples of Damascus, and verse 20, look at this. This is Paul, this is why God chose him. Immediately, he preached Christ. He didn't preach himself. He didn't go and tell people, oh, my name is Paul, and this is what happened. No, he, didn't. he went and preached Christ, and him crucified. That's what we're supposed to do. Okay, so now let's all look. We're going to move down to 2 Corinthians. So after the book of Acts, there's Romans. Then there's 1 Corinthians, which is the book we've been studying. And then we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And we're going to be at verse 23. Okay. So, uh, are we going now, Corinthians? Yep, Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians, what chapter? Uh, Eleven. Okay, so remember, when the Lord Jesus spoke to Ananias, he told them that he himself will tell Paul how much he will suffer for his name. Okay, so here we go. Second oh. Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to see Paul actually talking about those things in his life, okay? First Corinthians chapter 11, Michelle, can you read verses 23 and 24? Uh, 11, okay. 23, 24. Yep. Are they like servants? I sound like, I sound like a madam, but I am a better servant than they are. I have worked much harder. I have been in prison more times. I have been with much more, and I have been near death more often. Uh, yeah, 24. Five times I was given the 39 lashes by the Jews. Three times I was whipped by the Romans, and once I was stoned. I have been in three shipwrecks, and once I spent 24 hours in the water. Amen. Okay, so you remember, the Lord Jesus said, I myself will show him how much he will suffer for my name. Well, look, here's the fulfillment of that prophecy. Right? It says, first of all, he says he labored more than the other apostles. Okay? Secondly, he, he got beat up a whole lot of times. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. So, you know why they used to whip them 39 times? The reason they used to whip them 39 times minus one, oh, we're getting something better here. So, let's cover from your phone, then let me just mute it. Okay, so the reason they used to receive 40 slashes minus one is because 40 they determined were kill a man. So, 39 was win that kill a man. So, that's why they did it. So it's 40 minus 1, which is 39. He, he got with 40 minus 1, five separate times from the Jews. Three times he was beaten with rods, that's six. Once he was stoned, we read about that last time. Three times he was shipwrecked. The cold wrecked. And he had to swim the shore. A night and a day he has spent in the deep. Okay, let's see what else happened. Verse 26 and 27, brother Todd. Uh, 27. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast about that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of, of Abraham? So am I. Okay, so I think we went a little far here, but uh, so in, with a lot of, 27 says this, in weirdness and toll and in sleepless often and hunger and thirst and fasting often and cold and nakedness. Besides, other things will come upon me daily. My deep concern, now look at this, all these things, he, he's been being, he's been stoned, he's been beat with a rod, he's had shipwrecked, he's been robbed, He's just beat up by his countrymen, all these different things. He has fasting, he sometimes doesn't have enough for food, he has enough for clothes. And it says this, besides other things will come to me daily. But look at this, verse 28. My deep concern for all the churches. That was his concern. Can you imagine? It wasn't himself, it wasn't even his friends or his family. His concern was the churches. See, that's a true man of God right there. 
we can just hope to be like that one day and God make us something like that. That's a true man of God. Because I know, like, I have my mind on things, like, you know, for evangelism or anything I have to do with the Lord. But sometimes I get down and I give a, I give a, I give a complaint. But Paul doesn't complain. Paul just moves on to the next assignment. This guy is a true soldier, true uh, man of God. Okay, now we're going to move back to Act 16, and we're going to see this play out. We're going to have to see one of these events happen, okay? So let's all move to Act 16. That's two books to the left, okay? And I think it's Sister Patricia from Sacramento. Let me read it. Act 16, yeah? Act 16. Yeah, yeah, Act 16, verse 16. Verse 16. And it happened that as we were going to pray the prayer, a certain slave girl having the spirit of divination met us, who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out, saying, These men are bond servants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Amen. Okay, so here we go. They're in a new city, right, and a certain slave girl who's possessed with the spirit of divination. Okay? So she's a fortune teller. How is she doing it? How is she making money for her, for her uh, slave owners? It's because she could really do it. But how can she do it? It's right there because she's possessed by spirit of divination. And when you consult these things, and I'm telling you a story, there was a lady uh, who called the ministry, her, her name was Goldie, and she kept hearing voices, and those things were telling her to hang up on us, and all these different things, and I kept praying. I didn't know what was going on. I never heard of that kind of spiritual warfare. I called Brother Emilio. He ended up calling her, and the Lord revealed that the reason this was happening was because she got involved with the psychic. And when you get involved with the psychic, the first thing you're doing is you're cheating on God. That's spiritual adultery. But he don't like it. And the second thing is, it opens up spiritual doors. And so we began praying. I'm telling you, that lady, I mean, if we couldn't follow up in the end, she like literally almost lost her mind. Because she kept going back to it, even though the Lord warned her. And so going, it's very dangerous to go to these things. But again, here's the thing. I've read this over and over. The last time we covered this, it was that morning, I think it was on a Tuesday, as I recall. The Lord spoke to me, and I didn't know this, but this is what he said. He commented on the scripture. He said, Paul messed up here. He shouldn't allow her to go on for those three days crying after that. In other words, he, the Lord was saying he should have took that spirit out of her right away. But I would have never known that. God said that. And so anyway, there's a spirit going behind her saying, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us, it says the way, but in, in the Greek it says a way. See how there always has to be a little line. Because Jesus is not a way. Jesus is the way, and no one goes to God but by Him, period. But see how these demon spirits keep coming in? They try to get on your good side. They say, yeah, we're Christian, and Jesus is a good way. No, Jesus is the only way, period. Amen. Right? Okay, verses. 18 and 19, that would be Sister Leslie. Sister Leslie, that's what and, and this she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authority. Okay, can you imagine this? This little girl is possessed. They pull up, they, they use the name of Jesus, the authority that Christ has given to them. That spirit comes out of them, and instead of being grateful and thankful, they go and beat them up and start dragging them to the authority. This is just so crazy, but that was the time they were living in. Verse 21 and 22, that's Sister Tracy. Wait a minute, no, I think it's, uh, Sister Lester, what did you read? 17 and 18? Uh, yes. Okay, so Tracy, you have 19 and 20. Oh, I'm sorry, I read 16 and 17. No, I'm sorry, I'm flat. Okay, Tracy, can you just read 19 and 
recording? Yeah, sure. Okay. But when her, her master saw that her hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities and then brought them to the magnetic mag, mag, and said, Let me in, I can't pronounce that in a while. These men, being Jews and unexpectedly troubled our city. Okay, go ahead and read verse 21. Okay. And then teach his customs, which are not are not lawful for us, being Romans who received or observed. Okay, so they're kind of lying on them and saying that these guys are teaching things that we're not supposed to do, the uh, guest Roman law, and all these different things. Okay, verse 22 and 23, that's just for devil. Yeah. Yeah. Then the ma then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be be uh, And when they had laid many stripes on them. They were then and two they they saw them into prison, commanding the jailers to keep them securely, securely. Okay, here we go. So the road both the two rolls up together against them. And the magistrates tore off their clothes. Do you think that they got commended for doing this great work? This poor little slave girl, I can imagine her, with just a torn little garment, barefoot, running around all dirty because she possesses this demon. And they're just saying, hey, she'll tell you a feature. Just give us your credit card. And we'll just run right this on this little uh, iPad deal and she'll just give you your fortune. And then they're all lining up. Why? Because the spirit of divination is in her. Right? Troubling her and troubling her. Paul comes down and says, by the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And now she's a beautiful little girl again. Her face comes, her complexion, all that. What do they do? They drive him, they beat him, they tear off their clothes, they beat them and flock. Right? And then they lay many stripes on them, and then they throw them into jail. Can you imagine that? Now I know at that point, that would be too much for me. I would have said, Lord, this is just too much. These guys are so ungrateful and, you know, all kind of, I might have been all crazy. But what is Paul doing? Let's see what he does. Verse 24 and 25. That's one. One, are you there? Okay, well, I'm going to skip one. Adam, are you there? Yeah. Oh, one, are you there? Yes, yes, yes I am. Okay, okay, so you're in, where, you know where we're at, like 16? Uh, 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 15? Yeah, 15. Yeah, 16. Yep, and you got verses 24. Well, you're actually going to read through 26. 24, 25, and 26, okay? Look at what happens. Here it is. This is what God wants us. But at midnight, 
all his prayers were praying and singing hymns to God. Right? Singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them like, wow, these guys must really believe in God. Because these guys got beat up, they got brutalized by the police. I mean, can you imagine these guys got so brutalized, it was like what we see on TV. People have their cell phones, they're all recording this for the news. They were saying, these guys were doing, were moving a steer. Look at how they got, they got abused by the police. and made Fox News, they made CNN, they made all those things. And they're in jail. But instead of complaining, instead of getting their attorney, instead of posting these things on Facebook, what did they do? They prayed and they sang hymns to God. Now look at this. We're going to see God applauding. Suddenly there was a great earthquake. I have a feeling that's God applauding. So that the foundation of the prisons were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loose. When we were covering the book of Acts, you remember that our little motto, our little Bible study motto was this. That God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he, and he is. And so one time I was talking to someone who's very close to the Lord, and they were sharing this. That they were worshiping the Lord, and they said, I had never felt this before. And I said, what happened? And they said, I continue to worship the Lord, and he drew near, and I could feel his presence. And I sang more, and I said, it's not enough, Lord. I want more of you. I want more of you. I want more of you. And this is what the person said. They said that the Lord answered, and that the room literally shook with his presence. You see, these are not just stories in the Bible. These are things that are happening today. Amen. You can worship the Lord, and you can sing to Him, and you can continue, and you still His presence. You say, Lord, I thank you for your presence, but it's not enough. I want more of you. I want more. Come, come more, come more. And literally, His presence went into the room, and the whole room began to shake. See, this is not a Christianity. It's not a religion. It's a relationship with a very real God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when you cross that line and you just keep going and you want yeah. more worship, it will show up for you. Yes, I'm telling you, you got to try it. You got to go and you got to worship the Lord. Not because you want anything from Him, but because you just want to love Him. You just want to worship Him. You want to just praise Him. You got to do those things, okay? Now let's all move to Acts 19, okay? Acts 19, and I think. Are you able to read Jake? I think we skipped your last time. Okay. Okay, Donnie, you're going to be reading Acts 19, and we're going to be reading verse, you're going to be reading verses 11 and 12. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. God will perform extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Uh, 
were doing this, but the evil spirit said to them, I know Jesus, and I know about Paul, but you, who are you? So go ahead and read verse 16. That's the last verse we're going to read there. The name of the man who had the evil spirit in him attacked them with such violence that he overpowered them all. They ran away from his, his house, wounded, and with their clothes torn off. Okay, so Paul's so popular here that even the Jews heard about him, right? And then, they, so here we go, these are Jews. These are uh, almost like vagabonds, like, uh, and they heard about Paul, and so they said this, they said, they went to someone who was possessed, and they said, we exercise you by the Jesus who Paul preaches. So first of all, they don't know Jesus personally. So they don't have that authority, they don't have that power. And so here, look at, look at how interesting this is. Verse 14. Uh, so, the evil spirit, verse 15, and the evil spirit answered and said to him, through the man, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Man. And what happened? Then the man who was possessed with them, because these evil spirits have patrol them, leaped on them, all the power that prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Let's see if they had been Paul, because Paul was called to be an apostle, and he was given that authority, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he was a faithful servant, and so God was truly working through him. He wouldn't even have to say, come out of them. They could have just been his handkerchief or his apron. And the spirits would have come out of you. See how important it is to really seek the Lord with all your heart and to serve Him with everything you have. You got to be on top of all your assignments. Because the course, the more you're on top of your assignment, the more closer you move up to Christ. And so, what happens in order to keep that test? There's a pastor. He said this, and it's just so striking. He made it so simple, but he said, "With different levels comes different devils," and that is so true. The more you come, the closer you draw to Christ, the more uh, yeah. the more the more that he gives you, these bigger demons actually start showing up and they start they, they start harassing you. Watch with a little more power. Why? Because God is growing you. It's almost like you're in a gym. And now you're able to press fifty pounds and now he's putting seventy five pounds on you. And now you can press seventy five pounds and I now I put a hundred pounds on you. And you're growing. Your faith muscle is growing. Your desire to serve Him is growing. Your love for God is growing. All these different things. God has us in His gym all the time, if you're willing. Okay, we're going to work through uh, Acts 20 real quick, and we're going to see one last thing here with Paul, okay? Acts 20, so that's the next chapter. That would be Brother Todd is going to read. Acts 20, and you're going to read verses 7 through 8. Okay. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were where we were gathered. Okay, well, why don't you go ahead and read that? Read all the way down to verse 12. Okay. Um, and a young man named Eusetius, uh, sitting at the window, sank into deep sleep as Paul talked longer and being overcome and while falling asleep he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead but Paul went down and bent over him and taking him in his arms said do not be alarmed for his life is in him and when Paul had gone up and br had broken bread and eaten he conversed with them a long while until daybreak so departed and they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. Okay, here we go. So it's the first day of the week. It's a Sunday and Paul's preaching till midnight. Why is he preaching till midnight? Because God is giving him revelation and he's telling them this is what the scriptures are written. He's telling them everything God has told him. God is first giving it to him and then he's supposed to give it to everyone else. So he's receiving revelation about revelation. He received a revelation about the rapture, about the resurrection, about the true gospel. He's knowing all those things. Why? Because he's more faithful and more diligent than the other apostles. And God rewards that. And so here we go. 
He's preaching till midnight. When's the last time you went to a church service and they're preaching to you till midnight? But they were. And there was a guy sitting in the, in the, in the window. It's always the ones that are a little bit detached from the group. Okay? But anyway, he's sitting in the window. What happens? He falls asleep. He falls from the third floor. So they all run down there. Paul says, no, no, don't worry. His life is still in him. He lays on him just like Elijah laid on that one guy, on the boy. And he came back to life. And he brought him back to life. How are these things possible? How? Because suffering for the Lord. And he didn't complain. And he did it all. And he laid it down for the Lord. And the Lord uh, honoring those things. Okay, we're going to go uh, to one last story here. It's in first, uh, we're going to look at it. It's in first. Corinthians chapter 12, okay? And then, and then we'll close out, okay? First Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, let me just make sure that's what it is. Everybody go to First Corinthians chapter 12. I think that's what it is. Uh, oh, no, it's actually Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 12. I apologize. Second Corinthians chapter 12, okay? Now we're going to see something else that God gave to him, and that was revelation. And this is one of the most amazing things. So first, Second Corinthians chapter 12, and our reader is going to be Sister Patricia from Sacramento. Most being is necessary, so it is not audible. But I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know. God knows such a man was caught up to the third heaven. Okay, so he's going to talk about himself, but in a way that he's not talking about himself. That's why he says, I know a man. So see, you have to be very humble, because when the Lord gives you these things, you, if he shows you something, especially like a vision or, 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 or talks to you about something, you got to hold on to that, right? You just can't go blab it out to people and say, oh, you know what? God showed me this. They go on to the next person. Oh, it's not Facebook. No, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Unless God tells you to do that. That's different, right? But you hold on to these things, right? And you meditate on these things. And then if the Lord wills, he'll allow you to share that, right? But again, so he says, I know a man who oh, 14 years ago, this is the first time he's talking about it. Uh, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. Was caught up to the third heaven. Okay, what's the third heaven? Anybody know who resides in the third heaven? Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord. Right, God resides there, okay? So the Bible talks about the first heaven, which is the atmosphere. Here's the sky, where we have the clouds and the wind and all those different things. That's the first heaven. The Bible talks about the second heaven, that's where God is at, and this where Paul went. But the second heaven is never mentioned. Never in the Bible do you hear about the second heaven. The only reason we know there's a first, there's a second heaven, is because the Bible says there's a first heaven and there's a third heaven. So logically, there must be a second heaven. Anybody know why the Bible never mentions the second heaven? Is it that where hell is or something? No. That's where the, 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 the Satan, yeah, because Satan, yeah, because Satan has dominion over it, that's why. He's in the second heaven, that's why. Okay, verses 3 and 4, that'll be secure, bless me. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Wow. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being caught up, and that word caught up is like the rapture, right? He's being taken to the third heaven, and he, he was in, in paradise and heard inexpressible words. He can't even express the words that he heard. It's not even lawful for him to repeat those things. Man, talk about like if you're like a CIA agent and you just got something that is classified a false attorney. Are you turning into an attorney lawful? Yeah, yeah. No, that's what it says there. It says, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Yeah, 
Okay, verses 5 and 6, that's Sister Tracy. Sister Tracy, you there? You might be on mute. Sister Tracy? Okay, we'll go to Sister Deborah. Sister Deborah, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, we got verses 5 and 6. It affects the one I will not vote. Yet of myself, I will not vote. Except in my infirmity. For though I might desire to vote, I will not be a fool. For I will speak the truth, but I will leave anyone. She thinks of my of me above what he sees me to be. And so what he's doing is that he's humbling himself. That's why he said, "I know him." That right? he's not he's expressing himself now because he's receiving these revelations about the true gospel, about the rapture of the church, about the mystery of our resurrection. God has given him these things. Because he's given him these things, he has to give him one more thing in order to keep him humble. And we're going to read that. Seven and eight, that would be one. Okay. Okay. This is uh, Second Corinthians. Yep, chapter 12. Uh, Second Corinthians 12. 7 and 8. 7 and 8, okay. okay. So, Second Corinthians 12. 7 and 8. Yes. Okay. And at, that, and at least I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the relations mm -hmm. the thorn in the flesh was given to me. A messenger, a messenger of Satan to buff me. At least I exalted above measure. Mm. Concerning that, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Okay, here we go. He's getting massive amounts of revelation, and so in order to keep him humble, God allowed Satan to send a thorn in the flesh. So we don't know what it was. It was some physical ailment, but it was called by a demonic spirit. Right? That's what kept him humble. Was it like a disease or a mental illness? What was it? That was oh. thorn in the flesh. It, it could have been one of those. I don't think it was a mental illness, but I think that it, it could have been some kind of criticism of a thorn in the flesh. So I think it had to do some kind of ailment, right? But here's the thing. And he, and, he, and he said, three times, I pleaded with the Lord three times to depart from me. Now, again, Paul's an apostle. He has perfect faith in Christ, right? Because he's given that by the Holy Spirit. He knows God can answer him at any time. So three times he asked, he asked the Lord, right? But, you know, like these word of faith people pray, they, they teach that if you believe it, as long as you have perfect faith, God's going to heal you. It's not true. God will heal you according to his will. And for this time, it was not his will. Verse 9 and 10, that'd be Brother Adam. Brother Adam, are you there? Yes, I'm here. You might be on mute. Adam, are you there? Okay. Well, skip that. How about John? Are you there, John? I'm here. Okay. Verses 9 and 10. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in this, in distance for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Wow. Now, here we go. This is a, a scripture you really got to hide. What is infirmities? Infirmities and sicknesses. And so illnesses. Okay, so here we go. The Lord allowed this demonic spirit to hit him and attack his body, right? 
And he, and three times he goes to the Lord and says, Lord, take this away. And the third time the Lord answers him. And says, so you know he's not going to pray about this anymore because now the Lord is answering his prayer. And his answer is going to be no. But he, was, but he, he says it in a nice way. He says this. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now all say coffee. Therefore, most gladly will I rather fall in my infirmity that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Can you imagine when you are weak and you are ill and you are bedridden? That's when Christ shows up. And whose power is better, your power or his power? His power. His power, that's right. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmity, in reproaches, in need, in persecution, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, here we go, then I am strong. Why? Because Christ is strong to him. And that's the Apostle Paul. I just want to read one more passage here. I'm going to share a quick testimony. Second Timothy 4 says this. This is at the end of Paul's life. It says, for, uh, he was going to be beheaded, by the way. Okay? And it says this. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Can you imagine the crown that he's going to get? Ooh, he is going to be a big crown with all kinds of jewels, because he probably did the most for the king of the land, I know. Right? Finally, there is a laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. But look, and he goes on, and he says this, and not only me, but also to all those who love his appearing. Wow. That's everyone on this call that's waiting for Christ to show up. Right? And I think we covered this when we were going over rewards. But again, there's rewards and there's authority and different things that you get for serving God. And Paul's getting a big crown, a beautiful crown. But I was kind of saying this kind of teasingly, but you don't want to be the guy that's receiving a little Burger King crown. You don't want one of those crowns. You want a real crown because you serve God, because you laid down your life to serve God. And you don't want to be like the, you don't want to be like the Christian. You don't want to be like the Christians who are lukewarm in the book of Revelation, where Christ himself spits them out of their mouth. You want to be the one who are on fire. So when the Lord gives you an opportunity, you say, Lord, I'll go, I'll go, and there you go. Those are the things that honor God. I'm just telling you, I've not felt the Spirit of God in his presence like that day Saturday morning. He was bringing up all of you who said that you wanted to be like Paul. And even though we read the things that Paul suffered through, you all said, most of you said, you still wanted to be like him. And it touched yeah. God's heart. And so he's going he's gonna to give you an opportunity. I really believe he is. I wanted to share this this last testimony and then Brother Donnie calls down and worship. Well, we were talking about Paul, but he was saying, where is the power? That's what he's looking for, the power. People are coming in their talents and their ability to, to, to speak and those different things. But where is the power? And that's why I love testimony. And so actually it was Brother Ben who shared this, but it didn't happen to him. So what happened is that he met this guy who was a roadie. And so, uh, Brother Don, you want to explain to everybody who, what a roadie is? Yes, sir. A roadie is somebody that helps a musician set up their gear set up their equipment, and make sure everything's right on stage before the musician goes on to play. Yep, that's exactly it. So, Brother Ben met a roadie, who was a roadie for the Jimmy Slugger uh, ministry. Okay? So this is what he asked him. Like, most people, most Christians would have probably said, hey, what's he like? Or what's his family like? But see, Brother Ben's not into those things. He cares about God. And so he asked his roadie, he said, hey, What's the craziest thing you saw God do? And he said, oh, that's easy. I can tell you. But it didn't happen at a Jimmy Slugger uh, crusade. And he was kind of surprised. He goes, really? Where did it happen? He goes, at my dad's church. Because the roadie was a Christian and his father was a pastor. And he said, what happened? And he said this. He said that they had a church. It was one of these small towns in, in, in southern U.S. And so they had this 
big evangelist. They put out these posters. Some very famous evangelists were going to come to the church. And so they had put it out for months and months, and the church was packed. There was so many people there. And so his dad told his son, the roadie, you go to the back of the church with your friends. You guys go back there, because I want all the non-believers to be up here, because we're going to preach the gospel. He's going to preach the gospel. And he said the whole town was there. It was packed. The church was so completely packed, and they're at the back. And so before they called up the evangelist, they called... Uh, the, 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 his father, the pastor, wanted somebody to open up a prayer. And so he called this lady, like Mother Maybell, I think her name was, something like that. And so this lady was an uh, uh, old, like 80 year old black uh, African American lady who used to sit in the front row. And uh, according to the guy, she would sit there chewing her tobacco and she had this little uh, ball of steel and she would spit into it. But she was always at church. And so his friend, for the roadie, why did you dad show me a rocker at church? And yeah, uh, she was like 80 years old. Okay, so that's what happened. So this is the story. And so they're like, why did your dad choose her? And I said, I don't know, dude. I don't know. But he knows what he's doing. And so here comes the lady walking up the stage. And so she comes up. And everybody's looking at her. Remember, there's non-believers there. There's I mean, the whole town is there because there's famous evangelists is there. And she goes up to the mic. And remember what the Bible says, but power is perfected in weakness. And she went up and she said something like this, a very simple prayer. She said, Lordy, I know you're busy because I looked at your calendar this morning. But I was wondering if you might find it in your heart to step into this church for a spell. That's all she said. And he said that the Spirit of God, that there was such a rushing into the wind that they felt the Spirit of God fall and everybody fell on their hands before the Lord. He stepped into the church. Why? Because God chooses the weak things, the things that nobody will link to. Who would have thought this lady chewing her little tobacco? But she went up there and all she said is, God, I saw your calendar and I know you're busy, but I'm just wondering if you would find it in your heart to step into this church. And he did. That's the kind of people we want to be. That's the kind of people we want to be around. Where it's yeah. more than talk. Where it's the power yeah. of God. And He's here. Yeah. Amen. Okay, Brother Donnie, can you uh, go ahead and close us out and worship? You worship God. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I want you to admit that last week, uh, when you asked if, if, you, if, we, if we wanted to be like Paul, I said I would rather be like King David. <laughs> Here we go. Why not be both? Amen. Amen.